एक गवर्नमेंट की स्कूल है हम बच्चे को वहां दाखिल करने को तैयार नहीं है पता नहीं यार मास्टर जी कैसे होंगे क्या पढ़ाएंगे भरोसा नहीं है तो मैं प्राइवेट स्कूल में जाता हूं आर प्रॉब्लम इज नॉट जॉबलेसनेस इट इज अ लैक ऑफ ट्रेनिंग एंड स्किल्स व्हाई शुड अ मदर स्लीप एट नाइट वरिंग अबाउट वेदर हर ब्रिलियंट चाइल्ड विल फाइंड अ स्कूल टू गो टू We are woefully short of facilities to educate every child in this country. It's a huge demand and supply issue. We have a very poor primary school system. We have a very poor, almost dismantled secondary school system. So, can you sustain higher education uh, without the nursery which feeds it? हमने स्कूल खोला आउटले हुआ, स्कूल बन गया आउट कम हुआ, लेकिन जब तक उस गांव के बच्चे पढ़ते नहीं है पढ़ करके आते नहीं है तब तक सोशो इकोनॉमिकल इंपैक्ट हुआ कि नहीं हुआ उसका ध्यान नहीं जाता टुडे वी आर मॉर्गेजिंग आर फ्यूचर बिकॉज लार्ज पार्ट ऑफ आर एजुकेशन एंड ट्रेनिंग आर बेस्ड ऑन डिफंक्ट आइडियाज आइडियाज दैट आर नो लॉन्गर रेलिवेंट और हमें दुनिया के पास जो मॉडर्न टेक्नोलॉजी है लेनी पड़ेगी दुनिया के पास आधुनिक विज्ञान है ध्यान है उसको लेना पड़ेगा सर्टनली वी हैव द सीम्स ऑफ अ वर्ल्ड क्लास एजुकेशन Hello and welcome to Change India an agenda for the next prime minister. Today in the second show of our series we have 10 policy initiatives that will enable the next prime minister to almost revolutionize India's sluggish education sector. These have been culled from uh, recommendations made by a group of experts and you can get all the details from our website thinkindia.in.com. Uh, joining us in the studio are three of these distinguished contributors we have mr madhav chavan activist and founder president of pratham the largest ngo working in india's education sector ashish dhavan he is a private equity whiz turned education philanthropist who now runs the central square foundation we have harsh shrivastav who has uh, been in the government with the prime minister office and the planning commission and is now the coo of the center for civil society a prominent think tank And joining us on a satellite link from Mumbai is Manish Sabarwal, serial entrepreneur and founder of Teamlease, India's largest temporary employment company. And with them, with them, of course, is our very own uh, Dhiraj Nair, who has anchored the project for Think India. We also have an audience in the studio, among whom are some people who have actively pitched in to the debate on Twitter and on our website. I would urge all of you to contribute to future editions on Twitter and our website, and we would be delighted to invite you. to participate in the upcoming shows so let's get on with uh, the first point on our agenda and this is a very straight sharp one we should be permitting for profit uh, institutions at all levels if we can do it in health if we can do it in electricity why can't we do it in education mr chavan well it's not a question of permitting we have already permitted now it's a matter of legalizing it mm-hmm. people are running educational institutions which are making profit except they are not saying it's profit right uh, the it's trick is to i start a not for profit and then i uh, ask ashish to uh, give me management services and he charges what he wants and he makes a profit and perhaps by the back door i get the profit as well i think this is hypocrisy mm-hmm. it's happened all over it's been growing and so uh, like we we used to try to work against smuggling uh, i think we need to say okay for profit is fine but i but think why why should we do it why should we do it with such suspicion why should we not embrace it as something which is legitimate no no I, why I, should we do it only because it's happening by subterfuge so accept it i'm not i'm not suspicious about it the point is there is a there is you have to also protect the consumer right because i don't think all for profits are actually delivering the goods right so you have once somebody is going for profit then that person also that institution should also be covered by the consumer laws for example sure sure not, so i think there needs to be a clear separation between not for profit and for profit the fa- i mean the case in for strong business. regulation in any 
uh, for profit industry is a given. I mean, that, absolutely. that, that that's absolutely. Other than that, you have no, uh, we, we should have no, no other objection. But there are, there are implications to what happens when a society is divided like this. Today in India, about 60%, uh, well, 65% urban children are going to private schools already. Right. right. For, they are for profit, not for profit, whatever. And in, in the rural areas, about 30% children are going to private schools. So there's a large proportion of so, Indian children so already going to private schools. So almost more than 50% are going to private already schools. Already going to private schools. Right. Uh, and there is a definite uh, implication of what this does right. in a community, in, in right. poor villages also, that right. complete separation. Right. But that has to be dealt with. I don't think we can put the genie back in and say, let so, all girls so schools be government. You can't do that. Uh, let me go across to uh, Manish uh, Sabarwal in Mumbai. Manish, uh, you'd like to pitch into this debate. Uh, uh, if, if we are going to now legalize these for-profit institutions, uh, your sense of how we should be running them? Well, I mean, 90% of school and engineering capacity in the last 20 years has been for-profit. Um, unfortunately, as Mother Madhav said, on paper it's non-profit, which creates an adverse selection among education entrepreneurs. See, most education entrepreneurs have either been politicians or criminals or landlords. A teacher can't start a school because in a capital intensive business you can't raise capital. So I think the biggest case for legalizing or formalizing it is ending the adverse selection among education entrepreneurs. We've just got the wrong kind of people in, in many cases setting up educational institutions. The second one I think which is more important is our, unfortunately in India our rights as consumers are higher than our rights as citizens. So this is not an argument against government schools, it's just that as consumers, our parents are able to demand more, so the free schools versus what they should be, what they are on paper. And the third one is, there's no reason to be allowing these for-profit institutions to not pay taxes. Uh, any quick point, Ashish? Yeah, I would say, you know, the cat's out of the bag in the Indian context, and we know that government has abdicated its responsibility. So if we were to say, let's do away with the private sector, we are going to end up being in a much worse condition. So I totally agree with Madhav, we should legalize it. I, as a private equity investor, we never touched education mm -hmm. because we were always worried about the regulatory sword hanging over this sector. Right. Um, so what, 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 is the, what is the possible rationale of the government? Let's, let's look at it from the other point of view, in not allowing for-profit institutions. As uh, Mr. Chavan said, they are there, but legally not there. Why? I think the belief is that it's a public good, and so people are doing this. But so is electricity for the, for the greater good so of society. Health. My point uh, is, I, my point is, all of these are public goods. You allow for profit there, you don't allow it in education. <coughs> can I can I get uh, you in on this? See, the government's uh, state government's thinking is that education is a social good more than a public good, right? And it is something that you know uh, it links to what what is the fundamental role of government, because all the reforms say. Government should focus on what it does best and when it comes back to what does government do best? Law, order, education and health. So if the government is abdicating everything else, then at least these three things are what so far all the right. debate says what government's right. role is. But the challenge if you allow for profit is also that it allows schools to respond to changing needs. You know, if there is a local demand for right. something new, they can add something, they can get teachers quickly. If technology is changing, if the curriculum requires to be changed. So one of the advantages of having for profit is allows flexibility in schools. It allows you to set out what can what the economy needs. And, and this links in with our point number two, which is really the point on vouchers. Uh, we should be moving from this system of where uh, uh, you cannot directly subsidize to actually move to the voucher system, uh, where uh, you uh, where where it expands the choice for a parent to send the child to school. I think you know the great thing about vouchers. First of all, it establishes the notion of per cost expenditure per child. So as we think about the government system, and we want greater equity even in the government system, we need to start focusing on budgeting that's tied to per cost per child. You see a situation in even a city like Delhi, where schools are hollowed out, the children have left, the budgets haven't changed dramatically. So I think the notion of per child expenditure is important. With regards to vouchers in particular, it's not a simple solution. So just having choice is not enough. I think it's important to have informed choice and it's important to have accountability as well in the system. You can look at the example of Chile where over 25 years they've had a voucher system. It didn't lead to much improvement for the first 20 years. Mm -hmm. And after they 
did some capacity building, put some, played with some of the other levers that I talked about, it started to lead to improvement. But vouchers work as you, uh, the, the state gives you uh, the ability to send your child to any school and reimburses that. Is that, that simply put what simply. the voucher So the consumer suddenly has buying power. Right. You know, you've stimulated demand. Right. And then schools need to compete so, with each so, other right. so to you're create not, more of a free market. So you're not forced to send your child to the neighborhood primary school. You can send your <coughs> child anywhere. The state subsidizes yeah. the cost. So it's That's a direct right. benefit transfer to the family of the child. That's right. Yeah. But public systems hate it yes. because you're taking control away from them. Right. right. And I think it may mm. not, you have to build capacity for it to work. Right. Because that choice has to be informed choice. Yes. It can't simply yes. be choice. Harsh, come in. The uh, other advantage of vouchers, it allows rid poorer parents and socially disadvantaged parents who come from minorities, other communities, to have an equal shot at sending their children to the best school that they can send. Right. And that is a really, we have shown CCS has done pilot projects in this in Delhi, especially for girls. And you're seeing an impact when the children who go to good private schools or whatever right. the nearby private school, right. a much better education than they otherwise would get. Right. The other so, so, but yeah. rather, there's one other solution, which is you don't need just vouchers. In addition to vouchers, we can think of other mechanisms to transfer government money to private operators as a way to create more That's choice right. for so low-income children. It's, it's a direct subsidy. PPP is another solution. It's a, it's a direct subsidy transfer uh, yes. to the intended beneficiary rather than the forcing the beneficiary to go to a particular facility. So voucher yeah. is, a, is, a, is a proxy for that. Um, Neeraj, uh, sum this up for us. Well, I think, uh, Raghav, the interesting thing is that India has had 22 years of liberalization in its manufacturing and its services sector, but education has been untouched by reform. And I think that's really the problem, that it's education still lives in the license Raj era, not only in terms of mechanics, but in terms mm -hmm. of values. We still are suspicious of profit motive, whereas profit motive has worked very well. Uh, in other things, say telecom is a classic example where profit motive has worked very well with the public good. I mean, more people have a mobile phone in India after 20 years of liberalization than they did after 40 years of state control. Right. So that, that, I mean, that's, that's really the value change. And I think there are merits of the market economy which work in education, competition, Competition between private schools, between government schools and private schools, why not? And good regulation, another important part of the market economy, should be applied to uh, the education sector as well. So there's no reason why a well-functioning market economy cannot apply uh, those same principles to education or health so if it does to the rest of the economy. The uh, voucher system as it is being propounded today sounds like, I'll give you, uh, you have a choice. If you want to go to a private school, you can take money. I would like the government school also to be enabled to accept vouchers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. That, Absolutely. That is I, I, I don't think it's a question of private school. We're saying you, you, can, you, are, you can send your child to any school. No, no, no. Unless the government school is... See, government schools are paid, uh, given money by the government directly. Now, right. if you say that the child can go to either school right. and this government school will actually get vouchers, Correct. that's completely different. Correct. That requires decentralization of the government system. That's right. <clears throat> that is not there today. No, no. Even the vouchers is not there. I mean, even, even, even the voucher in a, on, on a large way, scale is not there. The 25 percent reservation is a yeah. voucher it, by the back row. Is a, is is a voucher there, which is not it's a direct It's the largest voucher. voucher scheme in the world, actually. <laughs> yeah. that, that's correct. So let me, let me quickly come to the audience and then go into a break. How many of you would support a for-profit institution uh, in the education sector uh, of the kind that has been discussed? Not so many. we see that. Can you, can you raise your hand, those who support the voucher system and the for-profit system? So we, we don't have too much support that, uh, <laughs> within, within our own public. And I think that is something that... Ask them if they went to private school or government school. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but this, is, this is where I think educating, uh, educating the larger constituency uh, becomes very important. And I think that's again a challenge for the, for the new Prime Minister. Well, uh, we'll take a break at this stage. Uh, do go to our website, thinkindia.in.com with your uh, suggestions. And stay right there, we'll be back. Welcome back to Change India, uh, an agenda for the next Prime Minister. And today we are talking about how we can focus on education, how he and his new government will focus on education to uh, get things improved there. Uh, we have uh, with us in our audience Dr. Uh, Ajit uh, Agarwal, who 
uh, has been tweeting to us and has, has actually written to us on our website. Uh, let's pick up uh, your thoughts, sir. Well, I think uh, the government should take, uh, should be mainly responsible for the primary education. And uh, although 97% people are attending primary education, but that quality is very low as has been shown by ASRI study and PISA study. What about assessment and uh, teacher training? How can we improve those two? Because those uh, points, uh, three and four, are on our agenda where we need to improve assessment and improve uh, teacher training. I think teachers have mainly have to see whether the, the boy is learning or not, and they should correct it immediately, not wait for long. So that, we, we are talking about standard, I think, assessment techniques as well, uh, where, uh, uh, let, me, let me come to you, uh, Mr. Chavanon. How, how, how can we get these two very critical points going? I think the assessment side of it clearly requires standardization, but that doesn't mean uniform standards all across. You can have standardization, but have different levels of standardization. The more important point is what is the goal that is to be achieved? The teachers often don't know what is to be achieved. We are giving them, you know, textbooks. For example, the Right to Education Act says the teacher should complete the syllabus in a given time. That doesn't make sense. We know that the reality in Indian schools is they are multi-grade and multi-level largely. Right. And so, uh, allowing the teacher first the freedom to work with the children to achieve goals in stages rather than in grades. But are we saying these goals need to be quantifiable, yeah, measurable? Absolutely. They are so measurable. Today we don't have that. Uh, they should be measurable. Right. They need not necessarily be the goals that we talk about today. For example, you must know this, this, this. The so knowledge goals are one. I think at the elementary level, it should be more skills based, right. expression, communication, writing. But have we reading. evolved these benchmarks for, for, for student no, testing as well as for teacher uh, training? They, they are not, in India they have not been evolved because we have not thought about them. But that doesn't mean they don't exist and that they cannot right. be done. It, right. They can be done. Harsh, the challenge is that assessments will tell you what is wrong. More important is to try and fix it. I work with the government of Meghalaya. The average pass out class 10th rate is 72%. But in one district, it is 27%. Mm -hmm. So you know it is wrong, at least class 10. But the ability to then fix what to do is a huge challenge. And you know, that comes back to all the other points. You know, there are no teachers. The teachers are not willing to be there. You know, their understanding of modern education systems is not there. So all your point four actually is even more important than point three. At some level, we are doing an assessment. But we still don't know what to do after that. Mm. But yes, Raghav, think. it's like you know running a company where you know your where your raw material is and how many employees you have. We don't have a sense of how much revenue or profit you generate. We need to measure outcomes, uh, not just for three reasons. One is to info, to create public awareness. No, I know we, we need to do it. The point, Ashish, is how. What what is what is the way to get it? There are sixty countries in the world that already have standardized assessment. Almost right. every OECD country has one. Brazil, Mexico, China, and, all have and, one. And why have we not been able to import this? It's been a little bit of this. First of all, this. There's a group of people who believe that testing is torture. There's another group that believes that there's not much purpose, like what he was saying. It, all it'll tell you is our system is broken. But I don't think that's a good enough answer. Right. You know, so I think that we've been, finally we're starting to see the government recognize that it's important. So at least there are some surveys that are being conducted by third party organizations. The government itself has a national achievement survey. They're now making money available to states to do learning surveys as well. Right. So there is a recognition of so the learning outcomes. So we still have to make, make the first building blocks but of But it's this. very incremental change. It's right. not, we're not thinking so of strategically where we want to be. Right, right, right. And Dheeraj, do you want to sum this up for us? Yeah, I think Raghav, I mean, it's a non sequitur that we should have a... Yeah, we should have better assessment, better more training. Assessment. And I think the entire emphasis in India, at least on the government system, has been on inputs. Get the buildings up, get toilets going, get... Uh, teachers hired, but there's very little emphasis on outcomes. I think that is something which really needs to change. We need to talk about outcomes, we need to talk about learning outcomes. I think if that change, the next Prime Minister can it just shift that di uh, narrative within the government from input to outcomes. That shift be a narrative, shift resources, yes. get the building blocks, import some of the uh, systems yes. that are working, as you said, in 60 OECD countries. Uh, start getting the data, Absolutely. start benchmarking, and then start acting. So I think that is, uh, those are the ways. And areas. learning will become central. I think that's the important thing. Once you measure, right. learning will come front and center. Right. We won't care as much. We'll still bother about inputs. They're important. Right. 
but learning will come front and center. Right. As we've said, these are two very important things which have right. begun to get done. These need to become uh, center focus for the next government. We'll take a break at this stage. Uh, if you have thoughts, go into our website at thinkindia.in.com. Uh, stay right there. We'll be back. Welcome back to Change India, an agenda for the next Prime Minister and we are discussing the education sector, what the new government can do and in this segment we want to talk about the higher education sector. We've spoken about the primary and the secondary education sectors. In higher education we've really got four points uh, for uh, the new Prime Minister. One is to, to create a new higher education regulator so that the multiplicity of regulators that we have a separate one for medical, a separate one here, a separate one for technical education. Uh, instead of that, we have one. Uh, we are talking about a complete deregulation of distance and online higher education. We are talking about the contentious point and uh, of allowing foreign universities to set up campuses. Remember that countries like China very easily allow foreign uh, universities to set up campuses. We still uh, are in two minds about it. And then the final point in this segment is to raise the fees at government funded universities by giving complete autonomy to the universities to run their affairs. So these are the four points uh, and I will go across to all our four experts uh, on these four points beginning with you Mr. Chaman. I am always the first to bat. Yes, okay. you are always the first to bat. Uh, I will start, I'll start yes. with the fourth one which is raising fees and so on. Right. I think in the entire sector something that Dr. Manmohan Singh had started talking about when he took over as the first time as the Prime Minister. The whole idea of student loans is important. Yes. Now that we have unique ID and so on, you need to have a way of giving students loans so that they can repay over a long period of time. So that it, it doesn't hurt them immediately. So it doesn't discriminate between the haves and the have nots. Yeah, I think on the point of fees, I mean, there's, you may as well s set fees at a much higher level as we said earlier and subsidize, really provide need-based scholarships. Yeah. It, it makes no sense. We're just draining the government uh, coffers when the vast majority of people, for instance, who go to DU That's can right. afford to pay a much higher fee. Yeah, people who pay, people who pay 3,000 rupees a month for school education suddenly have to pay 200 rupees a month yeah. in, for higher education. It just doesn't stand to reason. And for their next option, which is a private university, <laughs> they would have paid 30, 40x That's right. just as easily. Yeah. So, Arsh? Uh, for more than allowing foreign universities to set up campuses because that's a nice way for them to make a lot of money because when you go abroad you pay 12,000 you know much more money I would rather have more Indian universities being set up in small tier 2 and tier 3 towns if you are in Delhi or a Bombay student or Bangalore you have multiple choices and you can go to a foreign but if no, you're let's in stay Gorakhpur, with this foreign university point that you're not too much in favor of India I am in favor of it but I would rather incentivize Indian companies in which CSF can or invest in who will in invest which we are now seeing a big industrial group has announced an investment in an university in uh, outside no, Delhi. I don't think it's an either or situation. I think we need both. More universities. We certainly need both. But is there any particular reservation you would have? Because India would spend, I, I, s spend several billion dollars in sending Indian students overseas. If that very money gets invested in India in the creation of uh, a Harvard campus in India, an MIT campus in India, an Oxford campus in India, as is happening in the UAE, it's happening in Singapore, it's happening in China, it's just not happening in India. Yes, it would be a good idea to have private university, foreign universities come here because it will raise the benchmark for others as well. And what is today expenditure becomes investment in your own country. country. And mm -hmm. Raghav, I think what we have to remember is even if you look at the countries that are very open like China or Southeast Asia or the Middle East, foreign universities will still end up being a very small a very proportion. Small part. Absolutely. Secondly, don't expect Harvard and Yale and Princeton to set up campuses here. They're not interested. Sure. You can go and ask them, they're not interested. Sure, but there is a second but tier But there is a second tier yes. that's interested. Yes. And because it's not a corporatized sector, those right. would be one-off campuses here and there. Right. right. So, so uh, yeah, net net, it's not going to have a huge impact on our system. But and it has a demonstration. Of ex a yes, demonstration it, it has a demonstration impact. Let, let's go to Manish uh, across in Mumbai on this point. Uh, uh, on this point, as well as the other uh, 
uh, the four points together, Manish. Yeah, the fees one is, is clear. I mean, Delhi University getting 3% of its budget from student fees is, is just wrong. I, I, I don't, I'm actually not worried about the draining the coffers argument. I'm worried about the student accountability argument. If student pays larger fees, they'll depend, demand better service. So, so most universities in India only get 3% of their fees from, uh, of their budgets from fees and that is just wrong and that has to change. The foreign university one is, is, a, is, a, is a no brainer argument. They're, they're, the price point that they'll come at, it'll not move the needle on scale, but they'll become lighthouses for quality. So we shouldn't care whether a cat is black or white if it catches mice. So we need a number of genetically diverse, statistically independent tries in higher education. Foreign universities are one of the solutions. Sure. So I, I also want to spend some time, you spent a uh, fair amount of time on two points. Let me also uh, bring the focus back on deregulating distance and online education because we have a situation in the country where I think that you have a problem where you are confined to the state in which you are operating and in online there is no, you can't confine online boundaries. Uh, so a little bit of focus on, on, on uh, deregulating online education as well as the need for a new higher education regulator. I will come back to the panel and then go to the audience. So quickly please. The online, I mean, Anant Agarwal, who runs edX from Boston, can register Indian students, but a university in India or in Gujarat or in, um, you know, in Manipal can't do local students. So some of these so laws in our country this, just boggle your mind. Yes, I mean, you just can't. So there is an apartheid between you, you're freely allowing MOOCs globally to register Indian students, but you, you don't let Indian universities, you need a passport to operate from one state to the other. So just getting rid of this regulatory cholesterol in higher education, which has these micro regulations around geographic, around fees, around, I mean, it's a whole bundle of stuff where, because online and high distance education are going to be a very important component of education. We don't have the teachers for 1 is to 30. So just getting rid of all this distance education council, all the micro specifications is a no brainer and very easy to do. So Manish, let me come back to our panel here. I, I think our next prime minister really needs to look out over the next 10 years and see that higher education is going to get disrupted by technology, much more than school education. We're seeing that globally. And so it's silly to hamper the growth of online and distance education. This is the future. If we want to yeah. reach the tens of millions of children and drive up college enrollment yes. to 30%, yes. which is our goal, right. we're not going to be able to do no. it. Just so I think, I think it's taken, Mr. Chawan. No, so uh, as, as Ashish said, online education or open schooling is going to be the future. In fact, if you so look at... So we've we, got to liberalize it completely, right? Well, you've got to open it up. You yeah, know, I mean, and, and the way it operates today, open schooling or open universities are not open really. They're just stepped uh, children of the old system. Yeah. Now, when you actually start doing open schooling, the whole fear of some foreign campus coming here and all that is going to vanish. In that, actually, there will be more investors, Indian investors, who will start because a lot of the Indian billionaires have set up industries. Right. It is linked to your for-profit uh, business right. idea Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So I, I think everything hangs together. And you've got to understand that in, in future, having open systems is actually going to favor the deprived more than anybody else. Right. Harsh, your point. The uh, challenge is in India's higher education is driven by states. So each state of India has its own regulatory system. Then each of our professions which are under an act of parliament, so doctors, lawyers, have their own bar council and medical education. So there is confusion at the union government level and at the state level. So the next prime minister needs to convene a standing committee or like in the GST or the standing committee of finance ministers. You have to have a standing committee of education ministers of state governments and other parties to bring them together and say how can across the country there is a single market S and there is a single, single, higher single regulator, start. single consistent regulator. A single consistent regulator as there is say the SEBI, there is a <coughs> single consistent regulator for all stocks in the country, there is no state specific regulator. So similarly so, in education it can't be in Kerala there is one set of rules, in Karnataka there is a set of rules and already there is a market. Kerala spends 2000 crores a year sending its children to Karnataka for higher education. Right. Simply because there is no uniform. And even within the central government, you've got the law ministry, you've got the, the health, health ministry, ministry, you've because got Because they're the all under separate ministry. acts of parliament. They've all got their own. Dira Jul, uh, uh, sum it up for us and then I'll go to the audience. Yeah, I think the regulatory apparatus certainly needs an overhaul. I mean, the UGC is discredited. In any way, it's not a good idea to have the same body which funds universities to also regulate them. And in any case, we should move away from this funding, uh, the whole idea of mixing funding and regulation. Let funding be self-funding, let universities raise their own finances. But yes, so certainly, as Harsh said, a uniform regulatory structure across the country is 
crucial. I mean, in India, we just don't have single markets or single regulatory apparatus for anything, right, right. and it's not doing us any good. Right. So let me go across to the audience. Some of the contentious points that have been raised, raise fees for government-funded universities, allow foreign universities. Any, any thought uh, from the audience on this one? There are certain basic issues which, uh, uh, when we talk of uh, in generalities, we try to little, you know, ignore those. I think the basic uh, flaws in our system is the mindset. When we talk that so and so country is doing very well and so and so country is uh, developed so much, we somehow the other forget as to what are the ground realities in our environment. Okay, so you believe that these targets are premature? Yes. Okay. Any other point? Yes. My, my point is very simple. It's that we are talking about Indian universities, etc., investing in the country, creating more, say, universities in the say, two tier, three tier cities. However, my point is very simple that if foreign universities are not allowed, newer ideas, newer thought processes, newer ways of educating the youth is being let go of. So you're, you're in favor of foreign universities being allowed to set up campuses? Completely. Okay. Anybody else? Any other thoughts, sir? Yes, sir about the higher education regulator, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is quite uh, a well thought out process and um, it deserves attention, as a matter of fact, because then it will possibly uh, set up a specific uh, common standard for all to follow. But whether one single regulator, educator, education regulator, can dwell with all the technical sides of fields like uh, health and uh, medicine, right? Um, normal academic education or science science education. Uh, I think I, that's I a wonder. I think that's a very relevant point. Let me let me come uh, let me wrap this segment. This is a it's a relevant point. We can want uniformity, but isn't there separate rules that are needed for some very technical education, uh, for health related education? So. Mr. Rag Rag no, Rag yeah, the thing is, you can have reason? separate rules, but you don't need to have separate bodies. Exactly. So, yeah. you can have so one body with which has expertise from, I mean, so you're not going to have a single member regulator. You can have eight members, nine members, and have specialities. Have a health member, have a technical exactly. member. So, yeah. And actually, now the technical members are so, uh, you know, sort of treating all these things as their fiefdoms, that sometimes when you want to deregulate some parts, the way the medical education is, we need uh, maybe not doctors with five-year degrees, Maybe we need uh, GPs with three-year degrees and uh, diplomas. If you reduce it to that level, we would be uh, producing half-baked doctors, basically. No, no, we, we need paramedicals no, on a large paramedical scale. Paramedical is a different better thing. Better than having quacks paramedical, yeah. mass majority. Paramedical can is a be different thing as well. altogether. Quacks can be retrained So I think we are, talking about, we, are, we are here talking about a specialist doctor, uh, a doctor who can That's handle... Right. Uh, no, uh, even a GP. You need, uh, the gentleman making is fine, I mean, but... That's part of the problem. We're just going into one stream. And as the, the panelists have said, there are several different levels of medicine, paramedicine, and so on, which we need to do. And the problem with the entrenched regulators is that they just don't innovate. <laughs> so we need a new regulator so that at least we can think of innovative so ideas. So look at a problem Let's with debate a whole lot of ideas and let's pick and the best that, ones. And, you know, our states actually are a flexibility. We have 28 states. They can innovate themselves. Right. Right. You know, why don't we think of not them being our barriers, but as additions to our country? Okay, so as, you, as you've seen, this has generated a lot of debate and a lot of uh, thoughts have gotten uh, thrown up. This is obviously going to be a challenge for the incoming Prime Minister and his uh, Education Minister. Stay with us. We'll take a short break. Uh, go to our website at thinkindia.in.com. Uh, contribute your thoughts uh, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Change India, an agenda for the next Prime Minister and today we are discussing the education sector. We've already spoken about primary, secondary uh, education, skill assessment, we've spoken about the higher education sector. We are now going to, in the last segment, have our points 9 and 10 on vocational training and the Apprenticeship Act. Before I go to our expert on this, uh, Manish Sabarwal, there's a question coming in from a young lady here. I just want to say that uh, institutes are here and our teachers and audience uh, and students are taking you know active participation in studies and all 
but the employment is not generating in that corner. So I think no. that's so the, so the link between education and, yeah. and employment. I think that's uh, when you talk to a lot of young people, Manish, that is the key question that keeps on coming up. Uh, the employability of, uh, of the skills that they've learned uh, in schools and colleges. So take it away for, uh, for us from uh, po for points 9 and 10. Yeah. I mean, there, there is clearly a gap which has been developed. This gap exists globally, but in India it's been particularly large between what kids are learning and what employers want. So I think the, uh, the, the strong partition between the higher education system and the skill system, and, and there is a challenge because people want the social signaling value of a degree. You know, vocational education is for other people's children. You say, shadi kaise hogi? So I think there is an very important need to reboot this this massive difference so to create a corridor between a diploma and a certificate to give credit for apprenticeships to recognize prior learning so i think the hard partition between the higher education and this reflects the fact that this problem is is between ministry of labor and ministry of hrd so the national vocational qualification framework has been stuck in a dogfight between the two ministries for two, for many years now and somebody somebody above their pay grade needs to resolve it we have a minute yeah. and if i was to ask you the question on how you would do it if you were made the education minister give us three things you would do to get vocational into main Stream. Oh, you would you would uh, introduce associate degrees, which are two-year programs, which are not a normal degree on a diet, but vocational training on steroids. You would pass NVQF, and you would link, create the horizontal mobility between a three-month certificate, a one-year diploma, and a two-year degree. And you would also get credits so, for doing an apprenticeship would be counted as educational yes, credits, which is not yes. really done. So the today. apprenticeship issue. Yes, today you don't get. So the apprenticeship problem in India, you know, only we only have three lakh apprentices in India. Germany has three million, Japan has 10 million, China has 20 million. One state in Australia, Queensland has 25,000 employers giving apprenticeship. The whole of India has 25,000 employers. And, and this is would, not a new and, and issue in 19... And you would, you would certainly harmonize between Ministry of Labor and Ministry of HRD, between, which is really, this whole yes. apprenticeship act is falling in between these two stools. Yes, and in 1975, the 20th point program in Indira Gandhi's 20 point program was Apprenticeship Act. Today we have less apprentices than 1975. So it's not, this is not as complicated as higher education. There's one stupid act written in 1961, which means we only have three lakh apprentices. So this is something that the new prime minister can uh, uh, can easily, this is this is low hanging fruit actually, to come in and Very re low re re reboot the Apprenticeship Act and get a lot we of We could go to people. 10 million apprentices. Yeah, we could go to 10 million apprentices in 18 months. Months. to get a lot of our young people into uh, productive jobs. That's it then uh, for today. We've discussed 10 policy initiatives that the new Prime Minister can take very quickly and get the education sector uh, refocused, rebooted uh, and running up and running again. Thank you very much. Stay with us uh, as we unfold uh, more uh, strategic policy areas. Log into our website, stay with us on Twitter, contribute your thoughts uh, and uh, stay with this debate. Thank you. वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी इन काली सदियों के सर से जब रात का आचन गल के जब दुख के बादल पिघले जब सुख का सागर चल के जब अंबर चूम के नाचेगा जब धरती नग में गाएगी वो सुबह कभी तो